Hey gang, I'm Scott and welcome to my little workshop. Today I'm sharing with you my top 10 scroll saw tips I wish I knew when I started. Welcome back. Number one, do not be afraid of your saw. Yes, when you first start using the saw, blades will break a lot. And uh, one might get caught in the blade and chatter, but I consider the scroll saw one of the safest tools in the shop that has the word saw in it. Can you cut yourself? Absolutely. But it'll give you a band-aid cut. Um, it'd be like being scared of books because you're scared of paper cuts. Um, I saw another video where people were warning about removing the hold down on the front here because uh, you could cut your fingers off. That's simply not the case. So respect your saw, but don't be scared of it. Number two, finding patterns. When I first started in the late 80s, we had books and magazines and a few mail order resources. Today we still have all of those, but we have so many online resources, including a lot of videos here on YouTube on how to make your own. I usually send people over to Steve Good's page, the Scroll Saw Workshop. He has enough patterns to keep you busy forever. It's a great resource. I'll have a link to his page and others in the description. Number three, check it for square. Most saws have the ability to pitch the table to one side or both sides so you can cut at an angle. Uh, but most of the time when you're cutting, at least me personally, I want to cut with a 90 degree angle. So to check for square, I'm going to make two cuts. I'm going to make a cut. I'm going to flip it over and make another cut. So we have two cuts here. If they are parallel to each other, it's a good indication that the table is square. Uh, another thing I like to do real quick when I'm making stuff with a little piece of scrap wood, I will cut out um, a puzzle key. So now with that little key there, if I can bring it down and then feed it in from the top and it goes through, we know that we're square. And it's just a quick check. Um, it's something I'll do while I'm cutting throughout the day. Um, you can always start out with a machinist square. I'm just taking this ruler here. I do have a machinist square. I'm not quite sure where it is at the moment. And then you can just set it up on the table and then check to make sure your blade is square. All right, number four. Getting the patterns on the wood is a pretty crucial thing. Uh, there's, there's several ways to do it. We'll just go over a few real quick. Um, the easiest, simplest thing would just be to draw whatever you want to cut out on the wood. Um, you could take a physical pattern, put a piece of carbon paper underneath, and then trace over the top. That will also work well. You can make a template um, and then just lay it on the wood and just trace around it. Uh, this, temple, this template is made out of uh, some press board. This is actually uh, the inside of like a three ring binder I just had laying around. So there we go. We now have our our duck on our pattern ready to go. I don't know why I decided to do ducks, but I, I'm pretty happy I did. So we got a duck there. Um, what I do most of the time is this is blue painter's tape. I'll use blue painter's tape, sometimes packaging tape. Sometimes I'll just glue the pattern right to the wood. Well, for this example, I got blue painter's tape. I have a box here. This is my uh, box that I, let me swing this over here a little bit. There we go. This is my box that I use for uh, the spray adhesive. It catches all the overspray. What I like to do is take the pattern, put a little kink in it. That way I have something to grab. Now we are using Super 77. It's right there. There you go. 3M Super 77. I've used a lot of spray adhesives in my life. Uh, I always come back to Super 77. There we go. We'll let that sit for a couple seconds. Just waiting for it to tack up a little bit. Now I'm starting to be able to pick it up with my finger like that. Now the duck pattern, I'm going to look for the, the flat, nicest side. When I made the pattern, I made the bottom flat so that Mr. Duck will sit nice 
will sit up nice on his own. Uh, the original pattern, he was round on the bottom, but if he is round, he would want to tip over. So there you go. So this one's ready to cut. And then uh, another way of doing it would be uh, just take your, your laser engraver you have laying around and just laser engrave the pattern on. Simple, right? There you go, that works. Of course, I'm kidding. All right, uh, slightly later in time, Scott. Uh, I, f I forgot to tell you, you, you just pull the tape off when you're done, which makes sense. Uh, if you glue directly to the wood, what you would use is uh, mineral spirits. Um, just spray on top of the pattern. It'll go through the paper and dissolve the glue. Then you can just peel the pattern right off and wipe it off. Um, if you are using mineral spirits, please, please, please let it dry completely before you do something silly, like uh, make a piece of fretwork and then uh, use mineral spirits and then flip it over and thinking it's dry and use a torch to burn some fuzzies off the back and next thing you know you have a big flaming piece of fretwork. Uh, not that I've ever done that twice. So there you go. Be safe kids and let's get back to it. Number five, think of your patterns as a guide. They're not absolute. You know, if, you, if you're not making something intricate, if you're not exactly on the line, it's not going to be end of the world. You know, try to glide back. You know, take your time going back in, into your line. Don't do anything sharp or jagged, otherwise it's going to be all jagged. So, you know, do the best you can, but just because something goes off the line a little bit, it's not the end of the world. You know, this is supposed to be fun. <laughs> Number six, stack cutting. If you're going to cut multiple copies of one pattern on thinner wood, stack cutting is a great time saver. Uh, I don't have anything really laid out for that, but I'll demonstrate different ways of uh, putting the wood together. So if you have, you can cut out two ducks, you can cut out two ducks at once. Uh, you can wrap the outside in tape around the outside, depending on what, what you're cutting. Um, this one would probably work, just wrap tape around the outside just to hold them together. Um, you can also use nails. Um, obviously with the, this is cherry, I'd pre-drill and then put a nail in at least three places, uh, depending on your design. And uh, double-sided tape, carpet tape. If it's something like this, carpet tape would be great. It would really hold on. Um, you're gonna have to clean it off uh, any residue back with the mineral spirits again. Um, Double-sided tape also works great. And then you can make two at once. All right, so I have, uh, I put in uh, one, two, three, four, five nails. And I'm looking at this and I'm gonna start with uh, the bill over here. I'm gonna cut this part out first. I'm gonna come around and then cut out this. So that'll give me support all the way to the bill here. So. We'll cut that out now. We have four little ducks. Number seven is uh, using a waste block when you're drilling your holes for internal cuts. Yeah, it's not really a thing to do with the scroll saw, but it is. You're constantly drilling holes. So if you use a waste board underneath, you're not going to get tear out. And tear, heart, tear out can ruin your project. So, you know, what I do is at first I make sure that I'm not drilling into my uh, table. Typically I have this clamped down, but for this demonstration I don't. So there you go. You know, you can be fancy and cut out something really nice that fits in there or 
he can just slap a piece of wood down as long as it supports it. So there you go, that was number seven. All right, number eight, cutting a straight line on the scroll saw. I'm not gonna get into blades and everything, but I thought I'd just mention that if you're gonna be cutting a straight line, you're gonna be cutting it actually at an angle. You know, the scroll saw is all feel. You don't have a fence or a sled or anything, and it takes time to get a feel for cutting. So if you can't cut a straight line, don't be too frustrated about it. Um, I'm just gonna demonstrate here. You know, this would be a straight line for me. I don't know if you can tell how much of an angle I am, but uh, I am quite a bit at an angle right now. Uh, this would be this would be straight right here. In order to cut, we're cutting at an angle like this. I wish somebody would told me that because it got a little frustrating when I first started. Number nine, foot switches. <laughs> I use a foot switch to uh, run my uh, scroll saw and my drill press and my vacuum cleaner. <laughs> It allows you, for the scroll saw, it allows you to have two hands in your material when you stop and start. Um, if you're doing a lot of internal cuts, it's a lot easier to turn the saw off with your foot. Um, the main reason I use them, and my beautiful Crocs, is to save wear and tear on the power switch. So there's two types of switches. There is a momentary or a dead man switch, which means you push your foot down, it runs. You take your foot off, it shuts off. And then there's a power maintain switch, which is basically click one to turn the saw on, click again to shut it off. So this switch here is a power maintain switch. So click it on and it vibrates this off and the camera, click it again to shut it off. Now this one over here is a dead man. You can hear the saw turn on and off. Uh, they both work well. Um, I've used both. It depends on what you're doing. If I'm doing a lot of fret work where I'm doing very tiny little cuts and I'm doing hundreds of them, I will put the momentary switch onto the saw just so it's on and off, on and off, on and off. Tapping my foot like uh, running a sewing machine. Um, so it's all personal preference, but it's kind of nice. And uh, I wish somebody would have told me about these when I first started. So that's why they made the list. Number 10, the magnifier. With age comes grace and uh, bad eyesight, so a lighted uh, magnifier comes in very handy. And the magnifier just does does just that. It magnifies things, makes things easier to see. Um, this one here, I believe I have a 3X lens in. It came with two. This one has a LED ring light on the bottom with three different levels and two different temperatures. So I use the, the bright temperature for um, when I'm live streaming and uh, when I'm by myself I'll use the warmer temperature it's a little bit easier on the eyes um, this one I got at Menards um, it, it, it was pricey you can get them on Amazon for relatively cheap prior to this I always used the old style that had the big light bulb on the top that you would screw in and basically back in the day when you had an incandescent bulb, you're basically making your tabletop into an easy bake oven. Uh, now it's not an issue. You just put an LED or a fluorescent bulb in there and, and away you go. Um, so yeah, magnifiers, they're great. So that's it. We made it through our very first video on this channel. So since this is my first video, well, other than the intro video, uh, I'm gonna be asking uh, you to uh, give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, feel free to leave a comment. I would really appreciate that. And if you like the video and want to see more, please subscribe. And if you want to be notified, ring the bell, but you've watched enough YouTube videos where you already know that. So I'm not gonna harp on you guys about that. So I would like an outro thing to say. So if you could think of anything awesome, like, uh, I don't know, like see you later or be kind to people, just stay six feet away, something like that, that would work. Uh, let me know if you got any ideas, but I'm babbling, so I'm going to let this uh, end right now. So thank you so much for watching, and we'll catch you next time.